Hello, uh, thank you all for tuning in this evening. I'm really thrilled to be speaking on an artist that I've spent about a year or so thinking about and learning about and, and writing about. And I'm really excited to be bringing that information um, about the show that I curated uh, to this group. Um, hopefully some of you had the chance to see the show in person, but if not, hopefully you get a sense of the show uh, from this presentation. Um, thank you again to the Hooks Institute for this invitation uh, and for the kind introduction. Um, as I was already stated, I've been at the Brooks now for just over two years um, and I'm entering into my third and final year as a fellow in the museum. Um, and since my position is fairly unique for museums, I thought I would spend a brief moment speaking about my position um, and the specificities about that position. Um, and then would we'll share a bit about the exhibition I curated that just closed a few weeks ago, um, some videos we produced in conjunction with the exhibition and obviously information about the artist uh, herself. Um, so I'm the Joyce Blackman Curatorial Fellow in African-American Art, Art of the African Diaspora at the Brooks Museum. Um, my position really focuses on a number of things, but mostly uh, is focused on creating an exhibition um, that I undertook research for as part of my position, uh, which is this exhibition I'll be talking about called Persevere and Resist, The Strong Black Women of Elizabeth Catlett. Um, and there's a publication that accompanies that exhibition, which I can show you an example of here. Um, and which is, has an image here on this slide. Um, and I'm also tasked with really making sure to create exhibitions and start to look into acquisitions or uh, works that are purchased by a museum that focus on highlighting African-American and African diasporic artists. Um, through this sort of exhibition project, um, the work on the left, my left, um, is the first in a series called the Black Woman Series, which functions sort of as the point of departure for the exhibition, um, is called I Am the Black Woman and is the first of 15 prints in this series. Um, the Brooks is only one of three known arts institutions in the U.S. to own all 15. So unless you're in uh, New York or Pennsylvania, uh, if you want to see all 15 in a collection, you have to come to, to Memphis, Tennessee and to our collection. Um, so these works, all 15, uh, have been in storage for the last 20 years. And when I came to the museum and was interested in showing works in our collection, I looked at our uh, exhibition history and our holdings and saw that we had this full collection of the Strong Black Woman, sorry, the Black Woman series in our holdings and thought how wonderful it would be to show these works um, since they've just been sitting in our storage for the last 20 years and Memphis audiences haven't had the chance to really get to know the collection. So those function mostly as the catalyst for the exhibition. On the right, you can see a poster that we produced for the exhibition. Um, you can see that it depicts uh, another one of these prints. Um, this one is called I've Always Worked Hard in America. Um, I'll speak a bit more about the prints, but I'm only going to show a few of them. So if you're really interested in uh, seeing more of them, please do Google or look up or look into some of the um, scholarship written on the artist to see a full range of her prints. So before I break into the exhibition, I wanted to share a little bit of information about the artist because something I learned through giving tours for the three month uh, run of the show was that most people who came to see the show were not familiar with the artist. Some people were, but for the most part, she was unfamiliar to many of our visitors. So just some brief, brief information. She was an African-American and Mexican sculptor and printmaker, uh, born and raised in Washington, D.C., which is my hometown, um, attended Howard University. Um, she was initially admitted into Carnegie Mellon, uh, and as soon as they found out that she was African-American, they rescinded her offer. Uh, so she attended Howard University and studied under, I think, some of the people we, we would consider to be 20, 20th century pillars of, of African-American and American art. Um, Elaine Locke um, and Lois Milu Jones, who I wrote my master's dissertation on, um, and studied with um, other individuals like the late great Dr. David Driscoll, who passed uh, just last year. Um, she taught for a number of years, um, something she continued to do throughout her life, um, and later received her MFA from the University of Iowa, where she studied with Grant Wood, who produced uh, American Gothic. Um, it was there that she met Margaret Walker, uh, the poet, 
And in the exhibition I curated, I included a collaboration they did um, called uh, For My People, which included one print by the artist called Singing Their Songs. Um, this collaboration portfolio included text by Margaret Walker and prints by Elizabeth Catlett. The two met initially um, because the, while the university was open to African-American students, uh, the housing was still segregated. So they both had to live off campus. Um, it was only until 2017, which was, as you can see from her birth and death dates, five years after her death, that the university named their largest residence hall, the Catlett Residence Hall in honor of her contributions. As you can see, she lived all over the US, New Orleans, Durham, Chicago, New York, she initially traveled to Mexico for the first time in 1946 when she received a grant that allowed her to produce the series I referenced earlier, the Black Women series. Um, and it was after that experience coming to Mexico where she worked very closely with a number of artists and met her future husband um, that she really found that experience so pivotal to her career. Um, she eventually relocated to Mexico in part because the US government declared her an undesirable alien. And she only received her citizenship back from the U.S. much, much later in her life. But she essentially relocates to Mexico and it becomes her new home. Um, she works very closely with the TGP listed here, uh, which is essentially the People's Printmaking Workshop, which is a loose collective of artists and thinkers with left, leftist ideas who are interested in creating images, mostly prints, that spoke to the people, people in Mexico. And she continued to have an art practice in Mexico. She married a Mexican artist named Francisco Mora, had three children with him, and created numerous sculptures and prints dealing with social issues present both in the US and in Mexico, her new home. Uh, she became a professor uh, later on uh, at the National University where she taught until her retirement in 1975. Um, but as you'll hopefully be able to see um, in the exhibition uh, images, um, her last work in the show is from 2008, which meant that she was producing work well into her 90s. Um, and she was able to show a full range of experiences that Black women specifically face in society. And I think a number of the images will resonate as much today as, as they did back in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s when she was producing them. So I thought I would share a little bit of the um, installation shots for those of you who maybe didn't have a chance to see the show in person. Um, this is the first room that you enter into. Um, if you've been to the Brooks before, you know that most of our temporary exhibitions are on our lower levels. The exhibition spaces for this show were in the first two galleries on the bottom level. So you enter into this space with very, very low ceilings and very, very um, confined with these very dark walls, very dark inside because you've got works on paper that need to be in darker light or in darker spaces. And you've got three walls covered in prints. So the print series that I mentioned earlier, this, the Black Woman series, uh, five are in each of, uh, each of the walls in front of you. And they all follow the order that the narrative reflects. This sort of narration that accompanies prints is something that she learned very much from her friend um, and, and peer Jacob Lawrence, who many of you may know for his migration series. And in that series, each of the prints he produced had an accompanying title. So she takes that similar format and applies it to this body of work. This is the second gallery. Um, like I said, there's two galleries in the show. Uh, this is the second gallery, which is made up entirely of uh, loans. The first gallery are the print series that we own as an institution. And this gallery is made up of uh, loans from institutions uh, and also private collectors. So we had lenders from uh, Tennessee, Arkansas, Maryland, Louisiana, New Jersey, all over the country. Um, and we really wanted to highlight collections in our region. So there's a number of works that are from sort of the tri-state area as well. When I mentioned earlier that uh, collaboration between Margaret Walker and Elizabeth Catlett, right in the center of this photo is that series. Um, and then in front of you, you have uh, African American, which is the latest work in the show. There is a woman in every color in the middle and black girl on the right. Here you have a close up of the sculpture Singing Head, which was a loan from the Hunter Museum in Chattanooga. 
um, two of my favorite pieces, um, although I think I'm partial to, to stone. Um, you've got Stargazer on the left, which kind of greets you and also uh, says, says farewell to you as you leave through the space because you enter and exit the same way. Um, and Nude Torso on the right, which is this beautiful, really vibrant orange onyx color. And this is just a, an image that shows you from the um, entrance to the second gallery, what you're looking at is you as you go around the space. Unlike the first gallery, um, the way that you travel around the second gallery is very free. Um, I would say that for the most part, most visitors found that it was easier to start with the title wall and walk to the right in order to read the series in the order that it was intended. But obviously you can still get as much or more out of it by reading it in however order you feel. So I mentioned earlier that there's a few videos that I wanted to show that share um, different sort of um, perspectives about the show. Um, the first one I want to share with you is one that just was released last week. Um, and it was created by a platform called Shifting Vision. Um, I worked very closely with them over the last year to create a video that spoke about the exhibition as well as Elizabeth Catlett's work. So I'd like to share it with you all and hopefully you can hear it all right. When I first arrived at the institution almost two years ago, when perusing the collection and our holdings of African American and African diasporic art, I realized we had a full set of Elizabeth Catlett's The Black Woman series, which she created 1946 and 1947 while she was in Mexico. Before uh, deciding what the exhibition would be about, I was doing a lot of reading on race-based trauma and specifically research conducted on uh, Black women in the U.S. and by Black women psychologists. And so I think because it was so much on my mind already, I decided to look at her work through the strong Black woman trope, which I think is fairly commonly understood in sort of mainstream media and people are kind of somewhat familiar with it, either that or kind of variations of the angry black woman. Why are you always turning me into the angry black woman? Because you are. Most of the studies of sort of race-based trauma or intergenerational trauma studies have been on Holocaust survivors. Um, so less has been focused on black individuals, but I think it's very much an emerging field within psychology, which is interesting. But also a lot less easy to pinpoint since the strong black woman, although it was not coined until the 70s, the ideas behind it very much date back to chattel slavery and the idea that black women, like black men, were not human and therefore didn't have the same emotional issues as white individuals. So they could just take and take on, you know, more and more. But then obviously if there's no place to put those anxieties, those stresses, those fears, and those things are passed down from generation to generation, um, can be really damaging. I think of the strong black woman as very much a, a kind of mask. It's a protective mechanism. If the trope says, you know, you have to be confident, but not too confident, independent, sacrifice yourself for your children, your husband, your community, be a pillar of your community. If you're taking all of that on and you're not able to ask for help or, you know, God forbid asking maybe if, you know, anyone could, could take on some of that weight, um, there is a real cost. And I think the maybe Catlett was aware of, or maybe this was the way she was thinking about it. I think you can definitely see it in her works. You can see it in the fact that most of the women that she depicts don't speak. The only moments where her women open their mouths is when they sing. And so the idea that if black women are to speak, maybe that has to come in the form of art or music, or it has to have some sort of medium through which they can be understood and accepted. A number of the women appear to be strong, both mentally and physically, but for the exhibition, I'm curious to see whether we can read these figures differently and what seems to be strength and confidence can actually be a form of repression and suppression of emotions and emotional trauma that Black women experience on a daily basis. A number of the images explore questions and issues that were as important in the 1940s or earlier as they are today. And obviously the times have changed. We no longer live in Jim Crow segregation in the U.S., but you still see very much the legacy of that period. 
we're trying to think as an institution more about the stories that we haven't been telling. And obviously in my area, there's a lot we haven't told. And I'm hoping through this exhibition and through increased scholarship in the field, we'll get closer to a more equitable world, which would include having Elizabeth Catlett as a uh, familiar name as Rembrandt or Picasso or any of the white male artists that we consider icons today. Hopefully you got a sense a little bit of the exhibition through some of the images that were in that video. Um, some of them are the same as the ones I used earlier in the exhibition um, installation shots. Um, but all to say that essentially most of the works by the artist um, have been seen in these very sort of simple formed um, catalogs that explore mostly biographical information by the artist. And um, because there's been so little that's been explored past that, this exhibition kind of um, approaches it from a slightly different point of view. Um, and I thought that using this area of, of psychology um, and specifically the strong black woman trope would be an exciting and hopefully relatable uh, framework for individuals to be able to access these works. Um, we have as an institution done um, more to show African-American artists, um, but this is the first solo exhibition of a woman, a black woman artist in our museum's history. And so um, it's been a big moment for the museum and a big moment for uh, the artist because she remains very much um, not a household name by any means. Um, but uh, I know that for many of you who may be familiar with museums, um, there's been a real push to show more and more black artists, artists of color, women artists, non-binary folks um, in the hopes to start to remedy these issues. And I'm really hopeful that hopefully this exhibition um, can act as a foundation for the next show or the next catalog or the next scholar to be able to build off of. Here we go. So the video I showed earlier, by the way, is also available on YouTube, Instagram, um, and a number of other platforms. And like I said, it just was published last week. So it's very exciting. Um, but I also wanted to share a second video, which is one that we produced that you could see just outside of the um, exhibition space in the museum. Um, this was something that we produced um, to highlight Memphis specifically. Let's see. And here are some other images by the artist if they want to load. You can see that she has a real range. Um, she has a very specific style, but she's able to create um, very sort of smooth surfaces, use very gradual shading in some cases, and then other cases uses very stark and sharp angles to create images and faces. Um, and I think her work is unusual and exciting in that it's this very um, specific convergence of African-American influences, maybe 20th century African influences, Mesoamerican influences, um, influences by Cubism, which obviously was looking to African art. So it's a real specific convergence. So I think when you see her work, you kind of recognize, oh yeah, this is definitely a catlet. And the other video I mentioned is this one, which will hopefully play. <laughs> I am the black woman. 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 I have always worked hard in America. In the fields. In other folks' homes. I have given the world my songs. In Sojourner Truth, I fought for the rights of women as well as blacks. In Harriet Tubman, I helped hundreds to freedom. In Phyllis Wheatley, I proved intellectual equality in the midst of slavery. My role has been important in the struggle to organize the unorganized. We have studied in ever increasing numbers. My reward has been bars between me and the rest of the land. I have special reservations. Special houses. And a special fear for my loved ones. My right is a future of equality with other Americans.
that was something that we produced um, at the very beginning of the exhibition run. Um, one of the real motivations behind doing that was that I was really interested in finding a way to make the exhibition specific to where we are and, and to make it specific to Memphis. Um, otherwise, the exhibition could have been done anywhere. And I wanted to sort of draw a through line between the powerful Black women I was seeing in these images and the powerful Black women I was seeing every day. And so you'll see in the, in the credits, there's a number of women who are um, elected officials, lawyers, um, activists, uh, curators, scholars, um, artists. Um, and I wanted to show as much of a range as the artist was showing in her body of work and to show the really exciting work that's already being done here in Memphis and to bring those voices and those names to the fore so that people get to know them in the way that I've gotten to know them since I, since I moved here not too long ago. Um, this video, believe it or not, um, since uh, publishing it, has uh, reached over 700,000 views, uh, which is wild since it's um, something that I think none of us were really uh, prepared for. Um, but it's been really wonderful to know that um, these faces and these names and Catlett's words, most importantly, are being seen and heard by individuals all over the world. And again, as someone who studies African-American and African diasporic art, and has particular interest in studying the art of Black women, I'm really excited that we're moving closer towards filling in those, um, filling in that gap um, and getting closer to hopefully being in a place where uh, Catlett has uh, the, the name recognition of some of the artists that we think of when we think of museums and in Western canonical art history. Um, so yeah, that's kind of all of the presentation. Um, and I think I'm a little bit early with the technical difficulties, but hopefully I can just open up to questions or elaborate on anything specifically. Um, and I'm happy to, to take anything. So. so Heather, we do have a few questions. Great. So one of the first questions is, can you elaborate a bit on Catlett's designation by the US government as an undesirable or undesired alien? and what impact, if any, that may have had on her creative um, outlook or uh, products that she created uh, that's part of the exhibition. Sure. Um, so as I mentioned, she was very closely linked with the TGP, the People's Printmaking Workshop, which was very much seen as a, a Marxist and or communist organization. And obviously during that time, the US government was very, um, afraid and, and, and look, was looking out for um, individuals who might be linked towards uh, communism or, um, you know, anti-American essentially. And so um, because of her close connections with this organization, she was considered an undesirable alien. Um, she only received her, um, you know, her citizenship back much, much later. I think it was about 10 or 12 years before her death. Um, but she was able to, you know, find a home um, and a family in, in Mexico. Um, I think that as I was looking at the works that she would make, um, one of the ones that comes to mind is The Tortured Mothers, uh, which is one of her more famous works that was in the first video I showed. Um, and I always think about what it must be like to be a, a Black mother um, raising three boys um, in the U.S. and how perhaps that experience was better by raising them outside of the country and especially during this very tumultuous, very um, trying moment where in the 1950s and 60s and 70s you have the civil rights movement um, and, you know, the perspective she might have as, as an outsider um, looking in on American society from another country and the ways in which she could find parallels between the social issues she was seeing in Mexico, the social issues she was seeing in the U.S., um, but with a bit of distance. Okay. Um, Post George Floyd, are you seeing a difference in the art community and among museums in displaying work of African-American women artists and providing appropriate context and acknowledgement of their contributions? Um, I would say it's pretty mixed. Um, I'm in a very specific position where obviously I'm, I'm, I have this particular, um, goal in mind as a fellow to create this exhibition, to have a catalog that's contributing to making the field, 
um, much more uh, inclusive already. So that's inherently kind of built into my position. But I think a lot of museums, you can find countless articles about how museums, museum workers and professionals and artists are grappling with these issues and artists making works that speak to the consistent um, and constant inequities they experience both in and outside the museum space. So while I think it's definitely come to the fore in a way that it hasn't in a very long time, as far as I, you know, I've been alive, um, more so in the last year. Um, I still think there's a lot of work to be done and there's definitely a lot of conversations about, well, what does a more equitable space look like? And to avoid, you know, feeling like it's virtue signaling or tokenistic to then include black artists or black women artists at this time when previously you may not have. Did Ms. Catlett's message change depending on the medium she used, or do you think her exploration of the types of media simply paralleled her journey through her thinking about Black women and her own identity? I, I think it's quite consistent. Um, there's a really wonderful quote, and I'm not going to say the whole thing because I'll butcher it, but essentially she she's asked in an interview in, I think, 1975, if she thinks that art can change the world. And she says something along the lines of, I don't think that art can change the world, but it can help usher in this new uh, understanding that we can all have about how to change things um, and can help facilitate change. But this sort of blanket statement of art changes the world, she was very skeptical about. And I think you see this sort of tension in her work of these sort of what I like to call cautiously optimistic objects. Um, I think a lot of her portrayals are of Black women who feel conflicted who feel like they're seeing progress, they're hearing progress being made and decisions being made, but they're still facing reality uh, and discouragement in the actions and systems that exist. And so I think that she continues to have that perspective throughout her life that she obviously can speak to in that interview. And I think there's a number of artworks in the exhibition, um, Web Woman, which is a bronze sculpture that you may have seen that has a woman like this, and there's a web. I think it's a perfect example of that sort of tension between possibility and fear. Um, and there's a number of other objects that I think also follow in line with this. So whether that was intentional or not, um, I don't know, but I think it reflects very much her, um, her feelings as a Black woman in society living through from 1915 to 2012, so many moments in history, um, both you know in the US and elsewhere, and feeling really conflicted about sort of where we're going and, and if we are making progress. Now we have a question about how old was Ms. Catlett when she began expressing herself um, in her art, through art? So she studied art in, at Howard. Um, she was introduced to art very young. Um, so uh, I imagine she was, creating art growing up, but she studied art at Howard, uh, then studied art at her MFA at University of Iowa. Um, sort of started off with printmaking and then kind of pivoted to sculpture, but always kept a printmaking practice, um, but mostly worked in those two media. Um, and you could see examples of it in the show. I didn't have any examples of, of wood in the show, which I was really, um, uh, really wished I had. Um, she worked in, in wood, in stone and in metal, um, as well as in, in printmaking. So she was quite a master of many, uh, many media. And I wanted to make sure that that really came across in the show. Yeah, at the beginning, and you, you'll have to correct me where I misstate what you, if I misstate what you said, uh, I think you said the Brooks Museum has the most comprehensive collection of Elizabeth Catlett's work. So uh, we are one of three museums to have this body of work, the Black Woman series, the 15 prints, uh, in its entirety in the country. So it's us, uh, the um, Whitney in New York, and Patha in Pennsylvania are three of the known collections to have all 15. Do you know the history behind the Brooks Museum's acquisition of, of this work? Yeah, so uh, the works came into the museum through a gift from AutoZone in 2001. Um, AutoZone had a robust collection, um, and many of those works were gifted to the museum as one chunk in 2001. Um, and there were other works that were also by Black artists. Our um, three limestone William Edmondson sculptures came as part of that gift as well, and two of those are on view in our permanent collection. 
Um, and as for any of the other circumstances behind who, you know, who decided that that was something they wanted to pursue, I, I don't know. Um, but I feel very fortunate that, as I said, it's, you know, it's been in storage for 20 years which um, at first when I heard that, I thought, oh no, you know, all the opportunities this work could have been shown or aspects of it, one print or two prints at any given time. But as I said, works on paper need to be um, safely kept in storage um, and are very sensitive to light. So uh, this body of work as a group um, is only possible to all be together if they all are able to come out at the same time. So um, hopefully this body of work will come out again, but they'll need to rest for, for a while. Um, based upon your um, study of this history, and especially with respect to African-American artists, do you see any difference between the success or the commercial success of African-American male artists versus the uh, commercial or visibility success of African-American women artists? Is there a difference? Yeah, uh, there's definitely a difference. Um, one of the terms that um, usually with our exhibitions, we have an exit, an education guide that functions as a sort of like more for more information or resources or, you know, um, clarification definitions. And one of the words that I wanted to include in this um, definition section is massage noir, which for um, people who don't know, uh, it is a combination of misogyny and noir. So it's the um, specific experience that black women face in society that is unique to them. So discrimination, misogyny, and racism converging. Um, so I think we see this in everything, including the commercial success of, of artists. Um, I think that, you know, uh, the, I think the most, the most expensive palette piece at auction, um, it shattered records about three years ago, and it was $289,000 or something like that, which may seem like a lot of money, um, but I think that if it were a male artist, a, a man, um, we would not have, it would not have taken that long to achieve that, um, that price at auction, or um, it would have been shattered a very, very long time ago. So I still think um, that Black women artists continue to face this issue, um, you know, as much as, as she did back then, as, as it would be the case today. Um, so I think that it's very important to, to factor in all these individual aspects of identity in thinking about how artists and individuals walk through the world. Okay, and before I um, ask this last question, which I think would wrap up well, uh, some of your opening comments, I want to encourage our audience. Um, if you missed some of this presentation, it will be available on Facebook. So you can go to the Hooks Institute Facebook page and see it in its entirety. We also will have this recording on YouTube and you can go to our YouTube channel, which has been L Hooks Institute, and look at this video. And again, please follow us on social media and uh, please connect with us through other events. And you can find out about those events on the Hooks Institute's uh, website page, which is memphis.edu forward slash Ben Hooks. Now, the final question, you stated that um, this exhibit was shaped in part by some of your experiences in Memphis and interacting with people in the Memphis community. So how did um, this experience, how did you, what were your favorite observations, if any, observing people in Memphis react to Ms. Catlett's work? Oh, I, there were so many. Um, I did a lot of tours for the show. So I found myself in the galleries quite a lot. And it's very fun, although very scary to walk through a space and, and listen at what people are saying about a project. Um, a lot of it was um, excitement about um, an artist, a black woman artist being on display in the museum and something that a lot of people hadn't seen before. Um, and talking about obviously a topic that um, resonates with many people. And one of the reasons, as I said, using the strong black woman trope as a framework is because so many people recognize it. Um, and it's an easy access point to talk about these really critical issues um, because people recognize the references in, in film and in video. Um, it hasn't really been applied in a way that's obvious to visual art. So I wanted to kind of use that to access this, this medium. Um, but there's also quite a lot of frustration and sort of um, sadness um, uh, that she's not, she, she doesn't have the recognition that she should um, and that these works hadn't been seen before um, and that people weren't familiar with her work in the first place. And, and, and obviously I feel, I feel the same way. I 
Um, I came to her work fairly recently. Um, I didn't learn about her in, in elementary school, middle school, high school, college, or even graduate school, um, at least formally in the classroom. I learned about her uh, through looking up another artist. I think I was looking up DC artists and, and kind of came across her work that way, which just goes to show that one, even those of us who study this area still struggle to find um, information to learn about many of these artists because they haven't had the exposure that so many other artists have had. But two, um, just goes to show that so much of Black history is kind of finding these little pieces along the way and, and putting them together um, based on sort of interest and intrigue and curiosity. Um, and hopefully, again, creating a space and a network that then others who are interested in learning about the artists can then have an easier time finding more information about them. Um, so it's been a really exciting project. I learned a lot about myself. As I said, I was reading a lot about race-based trauma and psychology at the time. Um, and so I think uh, not, it's not every day that you get to learn about yourself through a project. And I doubt that many can say they learned about themselves through an art exhibition. So I feel very fortunate to have had the chance to do that. Well, Heather, Heather, thank you so much for um, sharing your insight into Ms. Catlett's work and very important work. And we at the Hooks Institute, thank you and the Brooks Museum staff for making this possible. And we look forward to hearing about your illustrious career moving forward and especially unveiling many hidden artists who have been marginalized because of their gender, race or ethnicity um, or for other reasons. And your work is so important for among other reasons, but especially that. So thank you again. And we have been absolutely thrilled to have you. Thanks again. Thanks, everyone.